Gears of War lies among the most impactful and influential games of all time. Originally conceived as a class-based shooter in the vein of Battlefield, Gears of War underwent significant changes in development thanks in part to the developers playing a lot of Resident Evil 4 and Kill Switch. The result was a game set in an oppressive world featuring elements of horror and a revolutionary third-person cover system. Although Gears was released nearly one year after the launch of the Xbox 360, it quickly became the console's most popular game, even surpassing Halo 2's peak player count on Xbox Live. With an explosive release selling over a million copies shortly after launch, Gears of War established itself as a pillar in the Xbox brand and helped cement Microsoft's position as a player to be taken seriously in the gaming space. From 2006 to 2013, the series had an amazing run with four entries on the Xbox 360. When the game released, I didn't own an Xbox 360, but fortunately, my cousin did. I'll never forget walking over to his house after family gatherings and running some good old Gears of War co-op and chainsawing locusts into tiny, gory bits. Realistically, I was probably a bit young at the time to be playing a game this graphic, but my parents never really said no to me playing an M-rated game. And while talking about nostalgia, who could forget the iconic Gears of War trailer featuring the haunting rendition of Mad World performed by Gary Jules. Hide my head, I wanna drown my sorrow, no This trailer conveys many aspects of what I believe made Gears of War such a successful title. Upon replaying the game, the aspects that stood out the most to me are its genre-defining gameplay, cinematic presentation, and truly next-generation visuals. And finally, just being gritty and cool as hell. Before diving deeper into Gears, I want to give an overview of the game's lore. Set on the scorched husk of the industrial and brutal planet named Sarah, Gears of War portrays humanity's struggle for survival against the subterranean creatures known as the Locust. If you fire up the campaign and dive right in, you won't be presented with much background information before being introduced to the two playable characters, Marcus Phoenix and Dominic Santiago, best friends looking out for one another during humanity's darkest days. However, before jumping into the game, I'd strongly advise watching the cinematic that plays if you linger on the game's title screen. Narrated by Locust Queen Mira, this pre-recorded video gives players a brief overview of Sarah and its history leading up to the game's campaign. For a time, the humans of Sarah knew the illusion of peace until Emergence Day. In essence, Emergence Day, typically abbreviated to E-Day, was the moment the Locust Horde broke through the planet's crust and attacked the humans of Sarah on all fronts, marking the start of the Locust War. E-Day's significance and catastrophic nature is such that time on Sarah is measured in relation to it. Our main character Marcus Phoenix is born 21 years before Emergence, or BE, and all events after the attack are labeled as After Emergence, or AE, with the events of the campaign taking place during 14 AE. The world of Sarah is one that knows little of peace, as Emergence Day took place just six weeks after the end of the Pendulum Wars, a human conflict that lasted 79 years. Within approximately a day of Emergence, the Locust Horde managed to wipe out a quarter of the global human population, leaving billions dead or missing. After roughly the first year of conflict, humanity took it upon themselves to deny Locust occupation of their civilization by burning nearly all the planet's surface to ash in the Hammer of Dawn Strikes. The Ultimate Edition remaster also features this introductory video, presenting it to players when they first boot up the game. I believe the video is a must watch, as it really helps inform you about the state of the world. The game's campaign unfolds over 36 hours, and despite its concise story, it leaves many questions unanswered by the end of the first game. Without viewing the introductory video, I believe many would be confused about what's going on during the game. The lore of Gears of War is intriguing and clearly warranted further exploration in subsequent games and books. The Locusts themselves are a fascinating topic, as throughout the duration of the first entry, you aren't entirely sure what you're fighting. Unlike typical sci-fi threats, which are often extraterrestrial, it's unclear if the Locusts have always been lurking beneath humanity's feet, or if they are in fact extraterrestrial aliens that made it underground. Additionally, Gears 1 lacks a codex or anything of that sort that exposes more information in this regard. With that overview of the lore of Gears, I want to talk about the gameplay for a while before touching back on the story. Let's clarify something from the start. Gears of War did not invent the third-person cover shooter. However, it significantly refined the formula. In an interview with Team Xbox, Cliff Plazinski, the lead game designer of Gears of War, specifically mentioned 2003's Kill Switch as a major source of influence on the game's cover mechanics. 
I had never played Kill Switch before, so I decided to investigate. When thinking about the third person cover shooters from the 6th console generation, not many titles come to my mind. Kill Switch, while very basic by modern standards, effectively introduced a cover system, allowing players to take cover against walls and other objects by pressing up against them and holding down on the left trigger. This system, similar to Gears of War, enables players to lean out from behind cover to fire accurately or opt to blind fire for increased protection. The game also features combat rolling, which looks and functions like Gears. Although Kill Switch's cover system feels floaty and has players simply walking between cover, instead of providing more tactical movement options, it was a trendsetter. After watching this video, I'd encourage you to go and check out the Kill Switch Wikipedia page. It's wild seeing how many iconic games cite it as a source of influence. Just three years after the release of Kill Switch, Gears of War hit the market and the evolution in the cover system is night and day. Taking cover in Gears feels accurate and snappy, executed with the press of the button with helpful UI elements. The UI makes it clear what actions you can take from your current position. When pressed up against the edge of a wall, the UI will display your ability to either push forward or snap to the next piece of cover, depending on the direction you're pushing the thumbstick. Players can rapidly cover immense distances through snapping between covers, rolling, and sprinting, despite the character's cumbersome appearances. I'm certainly not the best at exploiting this movement system and gliding around the battlefield, but I do have PTSD from going online and facing up against highly skilled players wielding the Nasher. While the 6th console generation lacked many third-person cover shooters, the 7th gen was filled to the brim with them. Many of these iconic titles were in development concurrently with Gears of War. However, it's difficult to dispute that Gears of War's profound influence on games of that generation wasn't the most powerful, and I'm not strictly speaking about gameplay, even in terms of color palette and the overall look and feel in the games, and this is certainly down to the fact that Unreal Engine 3 was extraordinarily popular during this generation, and Epic, who developed Gears of War, also created and maintains the Unreal Engine. For this playthrough of the original Gears of War, I chose Hardcore Mode and played solo. While this is usually where people would joke about not having any friends, it's just that my friends primarily play on PC. I do as well, and there is a Gears of War Ultimate Edition available on Windows, but I sought the authentic experience of the original release. Gears of War was also ported to the PC in late 2007, but this version is plagued by DRM, which is incompatible with modern editions of Windows, and features a much maligned Games for Windows Live service. Ultimately, it seemed like more trouble than it was worth getting into. During my research into the versions of the game, I also noticed that Act 5 of the campaign was expanded significantly in this PC release. The new chapters added to this act were also carried over to the Ultimate Edition, so it'll be great one day to play through them in the future. While I wanted the original Gears of War experience, I did play through on my Xbox Series X. The console does nothing in terms of enhancing the game's resolution, however it does bump the frame rate up from 30fps to 60, a change I greatly appreciate. It's truly regrettable that I couldn't revisit the campaign in co-op as it's clearly built for it. I miss the days of my buddies coming over and pulling an all-nighter to run through a campaign like this or Halo. Instead, I had to contend with the game's somewhat branded AI. Dom in particular seemed to have a death wish during my playthrough. He frequently got caught out in the open and even charged into melee range during the final fight with General Ram. It's been a very long time since I played through this game and initially, during my return, I was a bit unimpressed with the gameplay. Growing up, I played tons of Gears of War 2's Horde mode with my friends. Experiencing this step back in terms of gameplay here was a bit of an eye-opener. The opening act offers limited weapon and enemy variety. However, upon reaching acts 2 and 3, the game truly came into its own, fully engaging me in the experience. Initially, combat seems basic, but as the game progresses, it introduces new weapons and enemy types that greatly enrich encounters. During the first several chapters, you primarily face drones and grenadiers, who operate similar to the human characters. The simple introduction of wretches towards the end of the first act adds another layer to encounters. Wretches are nimble little bastards that can crawl around on most surfaces and don't take many shots to put down. However, in hardcore mode, two or three hits from a wretch can be fatal, and their tendency to attack in packs often forces players out of cover, prompting frantic evasive maneuvers which fellow enemies often take advantage of. Positioning is crucial in combat, and in the opening chapters, Dom frequently reminds players to flank enemies whenever possible. Flank 
players control members of Delta Squad, which always includes at least two soldiers. This allows one to lay down suppressing fire and hold enemies in place, while the other maneuvers around the battlefield, hunting for a better angle. Coordinating these offensives with another human player makes them much easier to execute, while in contrast the companion AI is fairly unreliable and goes down often. The lack of control over my companions was frustrating, however at the end of Act 1, Marcus is promoted to the rank of Sergeant, allowing him to issue basic commands to the rest of Delta Squad. And you're in charge, Sergeant Phoenix, as of now. Sergeant. It's nice having this gameplay element reveal itself at a time that coincides with the story, but I wish I just got it immediately, maybe at most 3 chapters in, not 8 chapters in. And this ties into one of my main complaints about Gears 1, where the opening act feels very basic compared to the later ones. New mechanics, enemies, and weapons are drip fed to the player, which makes things easy to understand at first, but in the modern day there's a lot more complex games, so coming back to this just feels very plain and basic initially. The commands that players can issue are basic, directing Delta Squad to the player's location or changing how aggressive they are. It's not much, but it was enough to help me keep them alive during the midst of a firefight. When everything goes right, Delta Squad members will pin enemies down for you, allowing you to catch them off guard and make short work of them, but the blade cuts both ways, especially on higher difficulties. Players will be dropped in seconds if they aren't careful. Being downed in single player forces you back to the last checkpoint, but luckily having your AI buddies go down isn't the biggest headache. Although they're stupid, the AI teammates are resilient as they stubbornly refuse to bleed out and die. This gives players ample time to clear the battlefield before reviving them, and thank god for this. Checkpoints in Gears 1 are often pretty far apart, and there were several occasions where dying sent me back around 10 minutes. A mechanic I haven't seen adapted to any other title yet as a prominent feature in Gears is the active reload system. I absolutely love active reloading. It keeps the player engaged during the usual downtime of weapon reloads and introduces a new appealing risk reward challenge. Anyone who's played Gears is familiar with this feature. During reloading, a bar is displayed beneath the weapon's UI. Within this bar is a smaller light gray section, and finally within that is an even smaller white box. During the reload process, a line will run across the entirety of the outermost bar. It can then be stopped by pressing the reload button again. Aligning this line with a small white bar is considered a perfect act of reload, and rewards players with not only a faster reload time, but also increased weapon firepower of around 8% for all bullets that were perfectly reloaded. A few specific weapons also gain other benefits from a perfect reload. For instance, the Boltock Revolver receives an increased rate of fire. If you aren't quite able to pull off a perfect reload, there's still a pretty good chance you'll land in the bigger gray box, which also constitutes a faster reload, but it's a bit slower than a perfect one and doesn't give you extra firepower. An act of reload can also be failed by stopping the line while it's outside the two aforementioned zones, causing your weapon to jam and punishing you with a reload that's significantly slower than normal. I always go for a perfect reload whenever I reload in Gears of War, and I'd encourage you to also. There's huge benefits to it, and it's not too hard to get used to the system. Though the system may seem minor, it significantly enhances player engagement, effectively serving as a minigame within the broader context of battle. Discussing Gears of War's gameplay isn't complete without delving into its arsenal. Although the first game doesn't boast the most vast selection of weapons, it features some notable standouts. First and foremost, I have to discuss the most iconic weapon in the franchise, the Lancer. This assault rifle equipped with a chainsaw bayonet is hilariously overkill, yet feels perfectly suited to the brutal world of Gears of War. I'm unaware of any other movie, book, or game that has conceived a weapon quite like it. Warhammer 40k does feature chain blades, but affixing one to a gun is a whole different beast. The absurdity of this attachment makes the temptation to use it overwhelming, leading myself and many other players to put ourselves in dangerous situations in the name of painting the ground with our enemies' insides. <laughs> Making contact with the enemy while wielding a revved up lancer will provide an instant kill. However, if you're fired upon while your chainsaw is raring to go, it will momentarily stun you, which leaves a pretty good opening for enemies to gun you down. So I urge players to please show some restraint with this beast of a weapon. The next two weapons I want to talk about are the Nasher Shotgun and the Longshot Sniper Rifle. I don't find these weapons to be particularly unique, but goddamn, are they satisfying as hell to use. The Nasher is a fan favorite, capable of shredding enemies at close range and dominating the multiplayer scene of gears. On the other hand, we have the Long Shot, a bolt-action rifle that offers an amazing sniping experience, allowing you to pop melons non-stop. 
Accuracy is greatly rewarded with a long shot as you only have one bullet available before you must reload. As soon as the rifle was available to use in the campaign, I was always wielding it or the torque bow, which is my favorite weapon in the franchise. The torque bow is another savage piece of weaponry. As players pull back on the trigger, the bow revs up, preparing to unleash an arrow armed with an explosive. The sound design of the torque bow is half of what makes it so satisfying to use. Releasing the tension in the bow sends the explosive arrow soaring, and with any luck, it'll find itself embedded in a locust's skull, resulting in a gratifying explosion of metal and gore. The last weapon I'll mention is the Hammer of Dawn, which possesses unparalleled destructive capability. The device players wield is merely a laser designator used to aim the satellites orbiting Sarah that are armed with emulsion-based lasers. This is a weapon of mass destruction in every sense of the word, and is a technology responsible for scorching most of Sarah's surface. Player's use of the Hammer of Dawn is restricted as it's only operable when a satellite is overhead. This conveniently limits player's access to this overpowered weapon. Typically, usage of the hammer only presents itself when the most fearsome creatures from the Locust Horde, such as Berserkers and Corpsers, are encountered. As any combat encounter concludes, whether by the Hammer of Dawn's blaze or by any other means, a satisfying guitar riff signals the end of battle. This will also signal our transition into covering each of the game's five acts. The narrative of Gears of War unfolds 14 years post E-Day and spans 36 hours, offering players just a glimpse into the world of Sarah. Key elements central to the series, like Emulsion and the origin of the Locust Horde, aren't investigated in depth here. In revisiting the first game, I tried to examine it in a vacuum of sorts without thinking too much about the story elements from the second and third entries. Within the confines of Gears 1, Emulsion appears to be a highly valuable and volatile fuel resource. Look at all that juice! Hey Marcus, how much do you think all that Emulsion's worth? I don't think I can count that high. For those acquainted with the later games, it's clear there's more to Emulsion than initially meets the eye. However, I'll delve into that in future videos on the series. Gears 1 sows more questions into the minds of players than it provides answers, which is fairly typical in media that aims to become a franchise. As Act 1 begins, players are immediately presented with a question. Marcus Phoenix, protagonist of the first three games, is freed from prison by his friend Dominic Santiago, who is typically referred to as Dom. Here, put this on. You'll need it. get into a lot of trouble for doing this. Not anymore. Things have changed. We better go. What about the other prisoners? We can't just leave them here. They're gone. Hoffman pardoned everybody. Is that right? Welcome back to the army, soldier. Shit. From the opening dialogue here, we're able to discern that the fight against the Locust is dire as the military is willing to enlist every last prisoner to fight. This makes you wonder what Marcus did to be the only one left behind, and establishes tension between our playable character and one of the highest ranked military officials. This question is answered in Gears of War 2, but by posing such a question right from the start, players are intrigued with Marcus right away. Upon exiting Marcus's prison cell, players are given the choice to go through a tutorial or skip it and get right into the action. I always appreciate it when games offer options like this, as it keeps the pacing tighter for those already familiar with the game. The first chapter concludes with Marcus and Dom making a frantic escape from the prison. En route to their next destination, the two join up with Delta Squad, composed of Lieutenant Kim and Private Anthony Carmine. Anthony marks the first of the Carmine family, one of which is present in every Gears game. During the flight, our playable duo learns they're en route to meet with Colonel Hoffman, a key figure in the Coalition of Ordered Government's military. Going forward, I'll simply refer to this organization as COG. Where are we going? Embry Square. Colonel Hoffman's waiting for us. Hoffman? Oh, shit. This is gonna be awesome. The banter between Marcus and Dom feels organic, as the two frequently trade insults, poke fun at each other, and berate each other, all while genuinely looking out for each other's best interests, much like true friends do. A lot of the dialogue among Delta Squad comes off as abrasive or sarcastic, yet this contributes to forging a strong and unique bond among them by the time credits roll. Smart guy a promotion, uh, give it to a jackass instead. Upon the arrival of Delta Squad's chopper, Colonel Hoffman spares no pleasant trades with Marcus and greets him coldly. You, traitor like you, doesn't deserve to wear the uniform. Looks to me like you need all the help you can get. Step aside. 
This scene also marks our first encounter with Anya Stroud. From the information I gathered, Anya is about one year Marcus's senior and should be around 36 at this moment. The model for Anya in Gears 1 certainly hasn't aged the best, and here I think she looks much younger than she actually is. No information is provided on Marcus and Anya's history, but the two do look at each other knowingly. Before the pair catches up, the whole party is abruptly interrupted by a locust attack. Amidst taking cover from the assault, Colonel Hoffman outlines the COG's new offensive strategy, a mission which spans the rest of the game. We now have the light mass bomb. I'll take Shoot out it. all these bastards with one shot. Up high. But it can't work if we don't have the targeting data. That's why we need the resonator. Watch the side. You missed. Hit them up their tunnel so that we can hit those sons of bitches where Come they on. live. An element that stood out to me during the game's opening was Gears of War's conservative approach to its heads-up display. Outside of combat, the UI quickly fades from view, enhancing the cinematic nature of the game with a higher degree of immersion. From Chapter 1-2 to the start of Chapter 1-4, Delta Squad presses forward on intel provided by Anya before they meet a fork in the road. This presents the first of several areas where Delta Squad divides into pairs to take different paths. In co-op, scenarios like this force players apart, compelling them to navigate a distinct route while still remaining pretty close to each other. Shortly after traversing the fork in the road, Delta Squad experiences its first casualty with the loss of Anthony Carmine. See? Sniper! This also establishes the reoccurring theme of having a Carmine die in most Gears games. Moments before his demise, Anthony Carmine was complaining about his weapon constantly jamming. You good? Yeah, but I got a problem. Something's wrong with this thing. It keeps jamming. I attributed this to his novice skills and saw it as a nod to the active reload mechanic. This sequence mirrors the experience many new players have when faced with active reloads, often resulting in their death amidst a failed reload. Delta's squad is somber regarding the loss of a team member, but just a minute or two later, Delta runs into the most upbeat character of the game, the Cole Train, Augustus Cole. Yeah, that was beautiful, baby. State your name, soldier. Private Augustus Cole, Alpha Squad, sir. Cole? As in the coal train? Yeah, that's right. We're as a former Thrashball star, a sport akin to American football, Cole's even more muscle-bound than other gears and has a larger-than-life personality. He's a member of Alpha Squad and is quickly adopted into Delta as the team moves to neutralize the Locust Cedars, which are disrupting their communication with COG Control. Following this assignment, players meet the rest of Alpha Squad, who have the resonator they've been seeking. The only other notable member of Alpha is Damon Baird. Baird is sarcastic and short-tempered, but also brilliant and comes in clutch whenever the situation calls for some technical prowess. The dynamic between Cole and Baird is like that of Dom and Marcus. This group of four is the central focus for most of the narrative in the Gears of War trilogy, and Baird even got a game that focused more on him with the spin-off Gears of War Judgment. Just as the two squads prepare to exfiltrate, everything goes wrong as their chopper is shot down and a swarm of locusts led by General Ram pour into the streets. Delta Squad's leader, Lieutenant Kim, is cut off from the rest of the team and goes out guns blazing before being grabbed and manhandled by the Locust General. Cut off the head of the and the body dies. Delta Squad, now comprised of Margus, Dom, Cole, and Baird, make an escape, only to find themselves in another dangerous situation. It's here where players encounter the first Berserker of the series. Berserkers are female locusts that tower over their peers and ruthlessly demolish anything in their path. This area highlights Gears of War's ability to weave intense horror elements into its action-packed gameplay. I remember going through this area for the first time when I was much younger and it caught me off guard completely. This chapter's design forces players to quickly adopt a new strategy and take advantage of the Berserker's destructive capabilities, raw anger, and biology as they're blind yet very sensitive to sound. Berserkers are immune to normal firearms and players can use that to their advantage to guide them like a bull through a china shop. 
In this instance and many others, you'll need to have the Berserker destroy structures and doors, allowing you to guide it outside, where you can summon the Hammer of Dawn to burn the beast to a crisp. With the acquisition of the Resonator, Marcus is promoted to Sergeant, making him the leader of Delta Squad. With this change in command, the team makes their way to deploy the Resonator in a subterranean emulsion facility. Act 2 begins as the sun starts to set on Sarah and has Delta Squad huffing it through stranded territory. The stranded are a group of civilians that want nothing to do with the COG. Hey, hey Piggy, I'm talking to you, Piggy. Blow me. Leave it alone, man. Fortunately for Delta, Dom has some history with the group, and the Stranded are also fans of Cole due to his Thrashball career. During interactions with the Stranded, the foundations for the future of Dom's story are also subtly laid and are fully fleshed out in Gears of War 2. Hey, Santiago, what you doing here? No news on the lady, man. I'll tell you if I heard anything. Act 2 brings some much needed variety to the game with the introduction of boomers and more weapons. It also features a gimmick beginning in its fourth chapter, Lethal Dusk. As darkness embraces Sarah, bat-like creatures called Krill reveal themselves and devour any creature not enveloped by light. The presence of these flying piranhas necessitates constantly finding ways to illuminate the path ahead, be it via spotlights or propane tanks. This lighting gimmick mixes things up, yet doesn't overstay its welcome as it's limited to the back half of Act 2. After finding their way to a car Dom bartered favors for, Marcus and Dom are forced to defend the vehicle until it refuels. This sequence kind of feels like a bit of a glimpse into the future of Gears of War 2's horde mode and I always appreciate a good defense mission. Once the car is topped off, Marcus and Dom may Make their way back to the remainder of Delta Squad and the game's only vehicle level. This car is equipped with a powerful spotlight that's used to burn away Krill as the pair navigate their way through a ruined city. This chapter gave me overwhelming vibes of one of my favorite enemies, Vampire Hunter D Bloodlust, and I was fully on board. It's not a long chapter, but be warned that if you die, you'll be sent all the way back to the start of the level. The second act finishes with Delta Squad assisting the Stranded in one of the largest firefights of the game. The entirety of Act 2 is great to play on an OLED display, as it's bathed in darkness, which looks great with the pure black levels that OLEDs can provide. This battle features several interactable set pieces that can help you even the seemingly overwhelming odds, one of which follows up on what players have learned in the act up to this point, where you can detonate propane tanks, causing a chain reaction that devastates the last cluster of enemies. Hey. Burn, bitch! Almost had us that time. At the conclusion of this chapter, we experience a nice moment that shows beneath the overbearing grimness of the Gears of War universe, there's still some fun to be had. There, turn that shit on. The next act begins still masked by night and pouring rain, but it doesn't take players long to find themselves deep within an emulsion industrial complex. The third act drops the krill, but does introduce a new kind of enemy. Control, we got what looks like glowing wretches out here. Copy that. We've had reports of Lambert wretches before, possibly due to direct emulsion exposure. Be advised, they are extremely volatile. What the hell is me? It means they glow in the dark. Yeah, they do. The Lambit are seen for the first time here and are a major factor in the grand scheme of things. Once again, this is another element we don't get much more information on this early in the series, and the COG seem blissfully unaware of the true threat the Lambit pose. In this Gears of War, the only member of the Locust that appears as a Lambit are wretches. This makes these wild creatures even more deadly as they're so volatile now they explode when they're deceased. As Delta works their way through the factory, they're faced with a cart ride. This feels directly inspired by the cart ride featured in Resident Evil 4, and it's a pretty fun sequence. 
Once the ride is over, the four take a lift underground, placing them close to their objective, but also within the Locust's preferred terrain. The environments seen in Chapter 4 to 6 of Act 3 are my favorite of the first entry. They feature dark tunnels, illuminated by neon emulsion that occasionally open to massive caverns hundreds of feet tall. Of all the areas in the game, the emulsion pumping facility seen in Act 3's final chapter is the location I remember the most. Finally. There it is. Working your way through this act only to come upon this facility bathed in golden light is a pretty unique feeling. Before Delta Squad plants the resonator, they have to fight their way through Theron Guards, elite members of the Locust Horde's military. Theron Guards often wield torque bows, making them deadly adversaries, but fighting them to get their weapons is well worth it. After the fighting is finished, Delta manages to plant the resonator and makes an escape above ground before the device unleashes a massive sonic blast. And finally, at long last, our boys get to have some well-deserved rest. So are we going back to base? I guess so. Good, cause <laughs> I'm done. Food, man. Hot food. All day long. Delta! Bad news. It didn't work. Fortunately, Delta's work isn't completely useless, as Baird managed to find a Geobot of unusual origin during their subterranean escapade. This sets up the fourth act, where Marcus makes a long-awaited homecoming, and plants questions regarding his father into the minds of players. Sir, well, it came from East Barricade Academy, from his father's house, specifically. Whose father? Sergeant Phoenix, sir. By the time Act 4 starts, every weapon and most enemies have been introduced to the player, which results in combat that's more satisfying and interesting to partake in. Unable to land directly in the Phoenix Estate, the majority of the fourth act sees Delta Squad battling their way to Marcus's home. The Phoenix Estate is grand, but has fallen into a state of disrepair. Located deep within is a lab where the team manages to extract the information needed to use the light mass bomb. The penultimate act is rather straightforward, but it's complemented by some of the best combat encounters in the game and a peek into Marcus's family. That brings us to the finale, Act 5. Earlier I mentioned that in the original release of Gears of War, the version I'm playing here, Act 5 is just three chapters long. The fifth act was expanded to eight chapters in the PC release and in the Ultimate Edition. I'm not positive what these extra five chapters entail, but they take place prior to where Act 5 begins here. I'd expect these new chapters to talk a bit more about how the light mass bomb got onto the front of a speeding train teeming with locusts, because in this release, we're thrown into the middle of a dire situation. Okay, uh, the bomb is at the front of the train, and there are plenty of locusts on board. You've got to get going now. Two thirds of this act play out as Marcus and Dom fighting their way up to the front of a train. The locusts throw everything they have, including General Ram at the pair, to stop them deploying the bomb which threatens their home. The third and final berserker of the game is also found on the train, and while it's a fun idea in theory, this encounter was very trivial. As you may have guessed, the final boss is General Ram. The general keeps himself shielded with a veil of krill absorbing incoming damage. He can also send the swarm at players, which will have you falling back on your act two instincts, hunting for a well -lit area. The first time I saw this swarm coming my way, I did panic a bit, which resulted in my death as you see here. In addition to this, there's locusts flying on mounts shooting you from the sides. I think this is too much information for the companion AI to really handle and make good decisions with, because in my case, Dom just kept throwing himself at General Ram and dying. He also stood no chance against the swarm of Krill who took him down more than once. Initially, I was struggling a bit with this fight as I was trying to force my way through using a torque bow. After a couple failed attempts, I decided to use the long shot and just patiently wait for opening in the boss's armor to land headshots. This was a sound strategy, and with it, I was able to take Ram down. This is definitely one of the fights where having a buddy on co-op would have made it way easier. With the death of Ram, Dom jumps on the escape chopper as Marcus moves up the train and arms a light mass bomb. It's a close call, but Marcus is able to escape the train before it leaves the tracks and dives down into a pit of emulsion.
With the successful detonation of the bomb, the COG resolve is higher than ever before. Earlier today, your gear successfully deployed the light mass bomb. We have destroyed the enemy stronghold. This war has exacted a heavy price from others. It has torn our world apart. But you have my word that we will rise again. However, the Locust Queen Mirror also has some thoughts of her own. Understand. They do not know why we wage this war. Why we cannot stop. Will not stop. Why we will fight and fight and fight. Until we win. Or we die. And we are not dead yet. This marks the end of Gears of War. However, I would encourage players to stick around through the credits, as partway through them, you're graced by the Coltrane making his musical debut. The Gears of War campaign is a solid experience that should take most players around 10 hours to beat. Some of my favorite overarching themes of the series aren't on full display in this entry. It's understandable though, as writers likely wanted to hold back on some of the bigger reveals to get players even more invested. It strikes that tone of a classic heroic first entry into a trilogy, like in Star Wars Episode IV, where the Rebels believe they finally struck the decisive blow against the Empire with the destruction of the first Death Star. The story places an emphasis on action, while also displaying the capacity to change the pace and lean into horror. One thing for damn sure is the game got players hooked on its gameplay and story. On Virtual Legacy, I rank every game I cover on my tier list. Gears of War lands on my B tier. There's enough I appreciate about the game that I contemplated giving it an A. I love how the story plays out over a brief yet impactful period of time and gets us acquainted with Delta Squad and the series' iconic gameplay. The opening act was the lowest point of the game for me and I was a bit worried that the whole game wouldn't hold up as well as I was hoping for. There really wasn't enough enemy or weapon variety there to keep combat interesting. The boss encounters also left a bit to be desired. Despite appreciating Berserkers, there's three encounters with them during a campaign that's not very long. Long. Throwing in a few wretches during one of the berserker fights could have made a really interesting and tense battle. I also didn't mention the boss battle with the corpse earlier, but there is one during Act 3, and once you figure out how to get the thing to scoot backwards, it's very straightforward. So out of the five boss battles featured in the game, really only the fight with General Ram is a regular fight, while the other four are kind of like puzzles. Had I never played Gears of War 2 or 3 before, it's possible the score here could have been higher, but the second entry alone makes large strides in almost every regard, and I certainly look forward to covering it. The best way to find out when the Gears of War 2 video comes out is to hit the subscribe button. I put out a new video roughly once a month. Lastly, I love to hear the community when it comes to these nostalgic games. I want to hear your most memorable experience with the first Gears of War. Maybe it was the first game you got with your Xbox 360, or maybe you got your friend in trouble because they weren't supposed to play games this violent when they came over to your house. Regardless, thank you all for watching and have a great rest of your day.